We good? You know where we go. It's live stream. Yeah. Ready? All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Michelle Hewitt, El Paso County Public Health Public Information Officer. Today we just have a few brief updates from Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers, Chair of, the, Chair of the El Paso County Board of Commissioners Mark Waller, Clinical Psychologist Dr. Lacey Edwards with Aspen Point, and from the Colorado, Fire, Colorado Springs Fire Department, we have Chief Ted Colas and Chief Co-Medical Director Dr. Matt Angelitis. We do want to continue um, to remind everyone to seek out those reliable sources of information, including El Paso County Public Health's website, and please also um, know that the public can use our Public Health Call Center. The number for that is 719-575-8888. Thank you. Good afternoon. Obviously at the city we have three principal priorities as we work through this crisis. Uh, number one uh, is the health, safety, and welfare of all our, our citizens. Uh, in that regard, we're staying in very close contact with the health department, uh, following their advice. Uh, I have uh, very frequent uh, communications with the Governor of Colorado um, and also monitoring all communications from the White House. There's almost a daily briefing uh, from the White House about all the various uh, issues going on, what the uh, funding streams may look like and things like that. Uh, our second priority, of course, uh, is the health, safety, and welfare of uh, uh, the employees of the City of Colorado Springs. Uh, a number of our employees uh, that can work from home are working from home. Uh, as to the employees that are involved in the direct uh, provision of uh, uh, city services, such as our firefighters, our police officers, uh, our uh, street repair folks, uh, our uh, code enforcement folks, uh, we want to do everything we can uh, to protect them and, and keep them safe. Uh, third priority, of course, is to begin to prepare uh, for the economic uh, impact of this event. There's no question we're going to see a precipitous uh, decline for an undetermined length of time in city revenues. Uh, and so city finance has to do all the modeling uh, so that we know how to, uh, to deal with that in terms of uh, cutting expenditures. Uh, while public health uh, remains uh, obviously our number one priority, I also want to echo, echo the calls by our local business community uh, to encourage lower risk ways to stimulate local businesses. We've got businesses that are really hurting. Obviously, uh, the closure of our, uh, our restaurants to in-service dining is a big blow uh, uh, to that uh, sector of the economy. Uh, but it's a creative sector of the economy, and I met uh, with the uh, restaurant industry yesterday and uh, just listening to some of the things that they're going to do to uh, make curbside service and uh, uh, pick up uh, service uh, available. Uh, that's a lower risk way that uh, folks can uh, engage in the, in, in the economy uh, and uh, have some uh, sort of normalcy in their lives. Obviously, we also encourage folks to, if you can't get out to a store, you can purchase online. Uh, you can talk about uh, purchasing gift cards uh, for a later use, things like that. The other thing I'd emphasize to our community is uh, I know uh, that we have a very giving community, and I think you're going to see uh, several ways that uh, you can help uh, uh, mitigate this uh, uh, crisis. Pikes Peak Community Foundation has set up an emergency relief fund uh, that uh, you can give to that by going to ppcf.org slash relief. The state of Colorado uh, has also set up a relief fund. Uh, that uh, information, uh, I'm sure, is available on, on a variety of sources. Uh, we've got uh, a new website uh, created by uh, uh, our, our city industry called uh, supportthesprings.com, and it's going to give all, all kinds of ideas for uh, supporting the local economy, and that's uh, at uh, supportthesprings.com. So uh, please look at that. Uh, the, my only other comment, and obviously I'll take questions afterwards, uh, folks, we've been tested before. We've had floods, we've had fires, we've had economic downturns. Uh, this is a unique and very, very challenging uh, test. 
we don't know how severe the economic damage is going to be. Uh, we're going to monitor it. We're going to see how long this uh, takes place. It's going to be painful. We don't know how painful. Uh, but we are going to get through it. Uh, we're not exactly sure what everything's going to look like when we get through it, but we will get through it. Uh, it's going to take leadership from uh, people like myself, uh, the commissioners, the council, uh, people, the department heads, the emergency uh, folks, obviously the uh, health department, which I, I want to sing, uh, single out as uh, exercising an incredible amount of leadership in this effort. It's incumbent on us as leaders to listen to the health department and get our direction from us. Uh, we have to be leaders. Uh, our citizens, uh, I think, uh, uh, hope understand that there's a shared responsibility uh, they have to do everything they can to mitigate this thing, take care of themselves, uh, practice good hygiene, uh, 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 appropriate distancing and things like that. And there's going to be some shared sacrifice. Uh, and we don't know what all those sacrifices are going to be. Uh, but I'm confident uh, that uh, this is a resilient city, a resilient county, a resilient state, and uh, we're going to get through it. Uh, and at some point in the future, uh, we'll celebrate the fact that we have overcome yet another great challenge. Thank you, Mayor Southers. Uh, I'm Mark Waller. I chair the Board of County Commissioners. And I, I want to begin by saying thank you, uh, mostly to the citizens of El Paso County for their patience and understanding as we move forward through the issues associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. But I also want to say thanks, and I, I can't stress this enough, um, the great work that our Department of Public Health is doing. Uh, they are, I, I think, really doing the, the kinds of work out there that's going to prevent this from spreading in the ways that it's spread in other countries and other areas of the world. And I think at the end of the day, that's going to save many lives. But I also want to say thank you to uh, all of the employees of El Paso County, 2,850 employees that are being uh, flexible and gracious about how we move forward uh, through this crisis. So uh, I think it's important in these circumstances to say thanks, and uh, we owe a lot of thanks to a lot of folks for helping us manage this in the absolute best way possible. Yeah, I want to reassure the citizens of El Paso County, we are open for business. Now we're doing our part to limit uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the public, but we are certainly open for business. We're doing our best to follow the guidelines set forth by the federal and state governments, uh, while at the same time maintaining the limits on numbers of people in buildings and things of that nature. But again, we are open for business here. I can't stress that enough. You know, it's the county's responsible to, the county is responsible to provide services through the state and federal government to some of our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, and to that end, we have, we have closed most of our public facing portions of our public buildings. Um, in particular, in our Citizen Services Center, that's where most people go to get their DHS uh, uh, services meant. They also go there for DMV purposes. Any public facing, facing portion of those buildings ha has been closed down with uh, very few limited exceptions. Again, uh, limited exceptions for DHS, limited exceptions for DMV. Otherwise, we're asking the public to stay uh, out of that building and certainly out of our other local buildings as well. Uh, many, many, most of the services uh, that we provide can be provided online. Again, I can't stress that enough. Uh, if you're looking for a service from El Paso County, chances are that can be provided online. Please go to elpasoco.com. That's elpasoco.com to look to see if the service that you're looking for can be provided online. In most cases, it can. And if it can't, again, in very few and rare exceptions, we will be providing those services at our Citizen Services Center and other public buildings. But again, most of those services can be provided online. Uh, in addition, uh, some of our offices have extended deadlines. So if you're a person that, that has a deadline that needs to be met, you have a, a service that requires some sort of deadline, understand that most of those are being extended at this time. 
Uh, in those cases, we've set up alternative methods of contact. Uh, we've established some uh, work from home procedures for our employees so they can still help citizens uh, maintain and get the services they need. Um, and uh, we have many of our other employees are otherwise on call so they can help us uh, continue to provide services in El Paso County. And again, if you want to learn more about service availability, go to elpasoco.com. That's elpasoco.com. Please go there before you come to one of our public buildings. Uh, and one big service that, uh, again, we're still providing is uh, services through our Department of Human Services. Uh, but again, most of those can be provided online. And please, elpasoco.com to find out uh, if your service can be provided online. Uh, other measures are being done by our other local elected county officials, including the sheriff, the assessor, treasurer, clerk and recorder, our DA, and um, uh, other commissioners individually. Uh, if you have issues related to one of those um, uh, services related to one of those uh, offices, you can access those offices through our website. Again, that's elpasoco.com. Uh, if you don't have access to the internet, uh, and you need to, to make a call, you can also do that, and you can do that at 719-575-8888. Again, that's 719-575-8888. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Commissioner. So I'm Dr. Edwards, I'm a clinical psychologist with Aspen Point, and I wanna talk about some of the mental health aspects of this change that we're all experiencing. So I know our community is flexing really quickly. Many people are moving to work from home at a really rapid pace, and there's a new normal coming, right? So what we've been used to was your rhythm, it was your routine, and now we need to lean into just developing new routines. So I'd encourage you to think through how, what would serve me best in this time? How can I best take care of myself, both physically and mentally? That could mean leaning into new ways of cooking, taking care of loved ones in the home, sleeping patterns, and also ways of lowering your stress. So I'd encourage you, even if you're home or if you're still in the workplace, lean into those areas where you can exercise. Find a way to physically release that stress. There's lots of options out there, including gentle methods such as yoga and stretching, moving all the way to YouTube videos that where you could do a more aggressive workout. But I encourage you to not keep that stress and anxiety bottled up. It's really normal to feel anxiety in this season where we have a lot of uncertainty and that's okay but we wanna make sure that it doesn't become overwhelming. So I would encourage you to give each other grace and extra margin with people you interact with. Know that with best intent, our whole community is shifting and we wanna do that to take care of one another, but it would be really normal for you to have a place in your day where suddenly you're feeling like anxious or maybe frustrated with something and we wanna take a deep breath and step back and say, okay, what do I need in this moment? What is my body or my mind telling me? And how can I respond to that in the best way possible? Um, I'd also encourage you to practice gratitude. At the end of your day, before you go to sleep, what am I grateful for today? What good things happened? What would I like to see happen tomorrow? When we set our minds with intention, we can make a strong path forward, both for ourselves and for our community. So I'd encourage you to lean into that. And if the anxiety does begin to feel overwhelming, feel free to reach out. I know the Aspen Point Crisis Center and our Telephone lines are open, we're ready to serve you. We also have many other behavioral health members in our community ready to do the same. So know that you're not alone and that there are people here to walk through this with you. It's uncertain for all of us. And that's a normal human response. So we wanna meet you there and also journey with you. So I'll turn it over to Chief Colas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you everyone, I'm Ted Colas, Colorado Springs Fire Chief. Uh, I'm here today to tell you about a new triage protocol that the Colorado Springs Fire Department and others in, uh, in the area, to include American Medical Response, are going to be uh, implementing. This new triage protocol enables our firefighters and paramedics to identify COVID-19 patients or those who are suspected to have COVID-19, but who are able to manage their 
uh, symptoms at home and try to give them a, a route and information so that they can do exactly that, manage their symptoms at home and not uh, overburden emergency departments. Uh, what we've seen across the country is exactly that, that, uh, that emergency departments can get overwhelmed with patients who are able to manage their symptoms at home. And if they clog up the emergency department or if they don't have COVID and go into the emergency department, that's a, uh, an area where there's a high degree or high suspicion that they uh, can become uh, exposed. Because our emergency department staff is uh, working around the clock to take care of patients uh, that are coming in that definitely uh, need that emergency care. Uh, the CSFD will continue to respond to medical emergencies as we always have. Uh, but this new directive is uh, given to us by our medical direction team uh, that has given us really a doctor's order to say this is how we need to proceed in order to keep our community safe, in order to keep our healthcare workers safe um, in the pre-hospital setting as well as in uh, inside of the hospital. Uh, we've got, as it was already stated today, we've got a limited number of healthcare workers in our community and we want to do everything that we can to keep them healthy and keep uh, maintain their ability to respond to uh, those people in Colorado Springs who most need our care. Now for any details around uh, this new triage procedure that we're going to be following, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Uh, Matt Angelitis from UC Health Memorial. He is one of our uh, co-medical directors for the Colorado Springs Fire Department and also American Medical Response. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys today about a new process that we're implementing in our community. Uh, the design and implementation is centered around protecting uh, the members and citizens of our community, as well as the first responders that we're asking to provide treatment to them. The protocol is set up to screen patients for potential coronavirus symptoms or exposures, and then to guide treatment for those patients in a very detailed way for our first responders. The process also involves real-time communication with physician medical directors. If patients or our first responders don't understand or have questions, we're there and available to video conference or real-time conference with patients in their homes or at the site of the calls to ensure that we're providing the very best possible care we can and to ensure that we're not unnecessarily spreading the virus in our community or to our patients in the hospitals who are most at risk. I expect that as our volume increases and we utilize this protocol, it'll be in a very important part of our community's response uh, to be able to main hosp maintain hospital beds and quality care for all the citizens in our community. I'm here to answer questions. I appreciate your time. Any questions? Well, we have some, uh, we have some people that are online here, reporters about that. Um, one question here is from Andrew Rogers, it was a year ago, uh, asking with the Manitou Springs incline closing, is it possible something similar might happen with the Garden of the Gods or hiking trails? Uh, very unlikely. Uh, as you know, yeah, the question is, uh, in uh, light of the fact that the city of Manitou Springs has chosen to close uh, the Manitou incline, is it possible that something similar to that could happen to uh, Colorado Springs parks? Uh, as you know, at this point in time, the governor in, in all the directives that have come down so far has actually encouraged uh, folks to get out uh, and engage in exercise as long as they uh, maintain uh, social distancing. Uh, that's certainly uh, our viewpoint in the city of Colorado Springs. We've had a lot of people this week uh, uh, with the good weather, uh, depends upon what day you're talking about, uh, uh, taking advantage of our parks. I saw a lot of people biking on the trails on the way up here. And I think uh, uh, most people are perfectly able to be uh, responsible about that and maintain social distancing. As to the closure of the uh, incline, I will simply say this. Uh, the Manitou Springs City Council voted to do it last night at a meeting. They did not consult the City of Colorado Springs beforehand. They did not consult the health department. Uh, I personally understand, for example, might, why they might want to curtail uh, the shuttle, uh, because that brought people together. I personally uh, would not have made the decision uh, to close the incline, where I think people can engage in exercise and uh, keep uh, social distancing. Uh, uh, based on what I know of the intergovernmental agreement between Manitou in the city of Colorado Springs, they really should have talked to us before they did it, uh, but they have in fact uh, uh, done that. 
and uh, uh, but in terms of uh, that being a precursor to anything that the city of Colorado Springs uh, might do with our park system, uh, I would not uh, encourage you not to view it that way. And we don't anticipate closing any El Paso County parks. Uh, so. Commissioner Waller indicates yeah. similarly. Yeah, and uh, it, in El Paso County, we don't anticipate closing down any of our regional parks uh, either for the same reasons expressed by uh, the mayor of Colorado Springs. Other questions? So, uh, one other question here uh, that just came in. Please address uh, CSPD response, infrastructure, expansion to establish more recovery or treatment sites similar to UC Health Tents or retrofitting existing buildings? I think different questions, frankly. Uh, obviously, uh, CSPD, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, there's no curtailment in uh, police services. Uh, there, uh, the, the police are obviously uh, doing everything they can to, pr uh, to protect their uh, citizens responding, uh, I mean, their officers responding to different uh, citizen situations. Uh, but in terms, it then turns into a, a health question, uh, which I think the health department or uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the PD uh, medical or the FD medical director is better able to address. So I believe I understood the question to be: um, Are our healthcare systems developing alternate treatment opportunities uh, for screening and testing? And the answer to that is yes. UC Health and Centura are both working hand in hand with our public health departments to set up additional triage, treatment, and testing facilities, and also working tirelessly with our operations teams to ensure that we have the equipment, staff, supplies, rooms, beds needed to care for those patients in our community that need that healthcare. I had a quick question while we're on it. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys are able to answer this question, but we wanted to ask uh, about how many people have recovered in El Paso County. I know we're trying to keep track of that kind of information, but is that something she might be able to field for us? Uh, currently, our first case that was reported in El Paso County is fully recovered. And do we have any other information on cases recovered? Is that just it? Um, that's the information we have available at this time. Um, do we know how we're keeping track of those sorts of things? We're just monitoring the same patients who have tested positive? Uh, yes. Got it. Uh, for the fire chief, I know we had talked uh, no more than a week ago or a little bit uh, prior to that about steps we were already taking. Is this new triage system different than those steps we had already implemented? Is this a more safe situation or uh, what's the difference? Well, the answer is yes. This is a new implementation. It, it actually, we started rolling it out to our employees on Monday. Uh, it's only now being fully implemented so that we understand the protocol and everybody has all of the correct direction to be able to implement that protocol. Um, there, are, there will be times, and uh, this I think that we need to uh, make clear, there will be times that our paramedics or EMTs may show up at somebody's home and speak to them, evaluate them, uh, look at all of their signs and symptoms and uh, go through some question and questions with them to, to find out what their history is and at that time advise them that uh, it's, it's not advisable for them to go to an emergency department by ambulance. Uh, that maintains that equipment and those first responders to go to the next call. Uh, so it provides more depth in our in our systems community our community system, um, but it, it's a change for us. It's something that is it is new, and we will give the best, very best explanation that we can to those uh, to those patients. And then on top of that, we're not going to leave them uh, empty-handed either. We're going to provide them with uh, the absolutely best. Uh, home health care information that we have available to us uh, that comes down to us through our medical directors from the health department. I can imagine that might be a, a frustrating situation for those patients who are saying, maybe I need to go to the hospital. What are you saying? What are you saying? I need to get there. But you're basically asking them to trust you. Well, to, to trust the medical direction, this was put through, uh, this protocol was designed with um, our medical directors and actually a team of uh, quite a few uh, physicians that put this together in the interest of, of public safety. Uh, we, we don't want to extend the exposure any more than, the we, than, we, uh, than absolutely has to happen. Um, and 
Uh, we understand that emergency departments are a place where there's going to be a congregation of sick patients. And when uh, we introduce new patients to that, we can either exacerbate their current systems, uh, current symptoms to make them worse, or introduce system, uh, symptoms uh, to patients that have not yet been infected. Ted, do you have something? Um, I gotta scroll back up in our chat here. Uh, thousands of blood drives have been canceled around the country. Is there a short supply here in Colorado Springs? And have you been talking to hospitals about this situation? Uh, absolutely. We um, are working with our public health departments and hospital systems to ensure that we have the blood that we need available. Um, but the news is accurate. We are um, short on blood supplies. Uh, question, uh, what can be done to prevent toilet paper scrums where people rush the store and fight for packages, thus risking spreading the virus and violating the crowd orders? I probably have as uh, we probably equally have no expertise whatsoever <laughs> on that topic, so I'll volunteer to answer it. Uh, I would hope that um, our stores, uh, I've, I've seen some signage, you know, so, um, so many per customer and things like that, and that seems reasonable to me. I've never been able to figure out this run on toilet paper myself. Uh, it does seem a little bit uh, crowd psychology uh, whatsoever, but I, I think it's an opportunity to appeal to our citizens in general. Uh, there's no indication that supply chains for uh, normal needs, food, uh, paper towels, cleaning things uh, uh, is unduly disrupted. I don't think there's any uh, reason to collect you know, five months uh, worth of uh, uh, toilet paper. Um, uh, there will be a supply chain and I'd ask you to be reasonable. But I really, obviously the government's not going to intervene and say to, you know, you can only give one roll of toilet paper per person and things like that. But I think stores have, uh, have kind of uh, stepped in. I've seen some signage, please only X number per customer and that's what I would encourage. Let me get in on this one as well. I, I'd also say we're all in this together. Uh, every citizen, every government official, every uh, small business owner, we are all in this together. And so I think we need to make an appeal to citizens to say, listen, take what you need, but don't take more. It's as simple as that. Because here's the issue that that causes. If you take a, a lot more than you need, there might be an at-risk citizen out there that needs to have uh, toilet paper or flour or milk or something like that, and they can't get it at that store. Then they gotta go to the next one, and they can't get it there. And then they gotta go to the next one, and they can't get it there, and gotta go to the next one. And all we're doing in that circumstance is putting at-risk citizens in more circumstances for exposure and more opportunities to get sick. So I think, uh, once again, we're all in this together. We all have to do our part. And I think for citizens, that means uh, don't hoard. Take what you need, but don't take more. We have time for one more question. Okay, let's see what else we got. Uh, this is for uh, CSFD. Uh, what is the threshold for actually taking someone to the ER? What symptoms need to be present? Uh, so if I understood the question correctly, what symptoms would warrant transport to the emergency department? Um, so we utilize the symptoms that patients present with. Uh, so cough, upper respiratory symptoms, fevers, congestion as an initial screening tool. And then we subsequently screen for risk factors. Those would be things like, are they elderly? Do they have comorbidities that might make them immune compromised like heart disease or lung disease or kidney disease? And if patients are young, have normal vital signs and have no risk factors for a bad outcome from coronavirus, they would screen as a patient that could potentially be left at home and not transported. Again, I wanna remind everyone that the concept is our hospitals have corona patients present and are full of patients with coronavirus and taking people into that environment unnecessarily is often not in their best interest. Uh, as the chief mentioned earlier, we do leave paperwork and a, a detailed set of information about how patients can seek outpatient care, non-emergent testing or treatment, they get information for phone lines and helplines to receive additional information and guidance. 
Uh, so, so we're doing our very best to provide excellent care and try and prevent the spread of the infection and potentially making those patients who um, utilize 911 sicker than they already are. All right, with that, we'll close. I would just remind uh, members of the public, if you have questions, you can call the call center at 719-575-8888. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.